rightly divide your word and uh, to be able to apply it to our life. We pray this through Jesus. Amen. So Mike said that uh, if you had any questions, I would answer them. Uh, but I think we'll run out of time before we get to questions. That's a joke. But, uh, you know, <laughs> if you do have questions, we can, we can figure them out. But I doubt I'll be able to answer all of them. Um, you know, we started this, this whole series of, of uh, How Great Is Our God. started way back in September. <coughs> and the idea behind this is, you know, we looked at Jesus. We looked at the Holy Spirit. We looked at the Trinity, the triune nature of God. And we looked at all the Trinity triangles. And, uh, and we've gone a lot of different angles. So we get to this uh, this month where we're going, and we need to give it more time, we can, where we look at the image of God and how we bear the image of God, and specifically uh, in some areas about how that works with uh, gender, being male and female, uh, how that works with the cultural issues that we're dealing with when it comes to cultural terms called gender dysphoria, uh, their term, not, not a term I'm familiar with necessarily, but to use that language, how does that work? And uh, even our own uh, sexuality, how we work that out in either uh, in, in our life. Um, and so we're trying to lay some foundations. So for a lot of us, uh, we probably haven't had, probably hadn't had to think about it. We hadn't had to deal with it, hadn't had to, it was not a thing, but, but in our culture, the way our culture moves, and, and look, there's nothing new under the sun, Mike mentioned this last week, uh, that, that the things that we're dealing with in our culture today are not new. It was very, very prevalent in the Greek and Roman Empire. Uh, in fact, you even go back, you know, when the, Greek, uh, the Greeks came into into. into Power, Alexander the Great, remember from your history classes, all, and that was in that 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. But you even go back into other, other cultures that were in, in contemporary with the Old Testament Israelites and the Hebrews, well, when a culture, and we see that, we see sexual deviance, uh, we see all kinds of things going on uh, there. And when someone gets away from God, when someone turns away from God, uh, very quickly they get into sexual immorality, okay? And that leads down a path of, of, of deviance that can get into, that degrades rather, can degrade rather quickly. Now, and all of us understand that. Uh, and we've dealt with this a lot. You, you probably dealt with it in your families, probably dealt with it personally. When a person turns from wanting to do God's will, it can get very... Uh, we've all been teenagers, or we've had teenagers. So we know the desires are very strong. And we've probably, we've all at some level experienced that. Let's say we could be PG-13 here, right? And Because uh, we're grown-ups. And so learning to let the Holy Spirit not, I guess, shape those desires and keep them where they need to be is very, very, is, is, is part of us walking out our God image in our life, in our salvation. But when a person says, and we're not talking about the struggle, I mean, there's a struggle, but when a person finally says, you know what, I'm just not going to struggle anymore and just head off into immorality, that's, let's put it this way, sexual immorality between a man and a woman, and let's define that, outside of marriage, okay, uh, whether it be fornication or adultery, stepping off into that and transitioning from one gender to the, to the other are not the same thing. They're on the same road, okay? It's all on the same road of, of, of deviance. Of, of, and it, we degrade to that. So well, I'd never do that, or I'd never, I'd never want to be with, uh, if I'm a man with another man or a woman with another woman. Well, it's on the same road. You know, Jesus said this, the principle of, that, of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, 
uh, I tell you, not, don't look lustfully upon a woman. Or I tell you, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, don't, don't even look lustfully on a woman. Well, they're not the same thing, but they're on the same road. All right? So Jesus says, let's back it up a little bit, and, or a lot, and get down to the root issue. And that's what we're trying to lay a foundation, because some of us, we've never had to think about the implications of some of these things. So um, Mike spent a great deal of time addressing some of that. And today, our goal today is to look and think about the image of God. Now, when you think of image, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Hmm? Okay, a photograph, all right, a picture, all right, what else? Let's put it this way, who do you look like in your family? You look like your mom, okay. Who else looks like their mom in their family, okay? Yeah. Who looks like their dad, okay, yeah. How many of you have said, oh, there's, there's, a, there's you see characteristics of both, yeah. Um, <laughs> when Avery, a lot of y'all know my daughter Avery, and those who know Avery, she looks like who? Yeah, she looks like her mom. I mean, there's even some pictures where they look like sisters. Um, you know, I think Karen has aged well because she married well. <laughs> no, I think she aged well in spite of, <laughs> of me. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's they even, they, they're probably, wow, they look like sisters there. Um, but, you, you know, that, there's that she is Karen's daughter. But when she was little, she looked like me. Uh, they were like, oh, you marked her, that's for sure. And fortunately, she grew out of that. My youngest, Hayden, this is what you got to look forward to, son, right here. This is it. Sorry. <laughs> this is, this is he's, he's mine all the way through. And, uh, and Nathan kind of has a pretty good little mixture. Reminds us of Karen's brothers more so uh, in the way he looks and his build and his blonde hair and uh, just as long as he doesn't act like them, we'll be okay. And I would say that if they were here, and they would probably agree, wouldn't they? Yeah. At least a couple of them would. Uh, we'll be okay. So, you know, we think about what we carry, uh, what we look like. And so if we carry the image of God, this goes way beyond what we, what we look like in our physical appearance. Because what does God look like? in physical appearance. We don't know. All the closest we get to is light. You know, and it says the Bible affirms that he is spirit. But we do know that Colossians 1 tells us that he is the exact representation that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. And he carries the fullness of the Godhead in physical form in a bodily form. So it goes much deeper than just our, what we look like physically, but it goes way down into how we are in our, in our nature. And that's kind of what, uh, in our deepest part of us. And that's, Mike alluded to that towards the end, so I'm kind of picking up this week where he left off. <coughs> As we develop this idea, I hope we see uh, and that we can understand that the image we bear is critical, one, to our spiritual growth. And that, that's really, really important, that, that we bear the image of God. And that creates a high view of humanity. Uh, and a, a, a high view not in a humanistic perspective, because that's part of the problem is that, that whenever you take, you know when I say humanism, what I mean by that? Humanism is that, you know, here's God, we're going to elevate ourselves to the level of God and then beyond, that we are God. Let's just deny God and worship ourselves. That's basically humanism, that I am the end all. And that's why you can come along and Chris can say, uh, you know, David, I don't think you're, you're right in line with the truth here. And I can say, oh, it's my truth, not yours. That's fine. You can't bind your morals on me. In fact, I'll tell you a story real quick that's jumped in my mind. Uh, so when I was in graduate school for counseling, the one, the one class that I avoided, um, okay, now this is going to be kind of ooh, 
story here, okay, but it makes the point in a very, very big way. Uh, uh, when I, I, the one class I avoided was multicultural counseling. That just didn't sit with me. Like, uh -huh, well, I don't know. I, I, I had all these other classes I could take. I didn't take that one. So when I left the counseling world, in the professional counseling world, and went into the school side of it and was working out at OCS for a while, um, I could certify as a school counselor with my, even though I didn't have a teaching certificate, but I had to have a license in counseling, which I did, and all these courses. Well, the one course I didn't have, yeah, multicultural counseling. So they offered it at ULM, with a, uh, and they were all school people wanting to be school counselors and others in, in, their, in their master's and doctoral programs to take this class. They or offered it in a three-week program, real intense program. I was like, all right, three weeks, I can suck it up, I can do anything for three weeks. And it was not a bad class. But this phrase that I just said kept coming up, oh, you can't bind your values and your morals and your truth on somebody else. Very humanistic thought. And, oh, but, you know, that's your morals. That's your values. That's your truth. It may not be my truth. And that's, you know, you think, okay, these people are counseling people. These people are helping people. And it gives you pause and alarm if you're a person that, adheres that there is an absolute truth and an absolute person that determines truth that or being that determines truth being God. Okay, you with me here? So all for about a week and a half, about halfway through this thing, I'm like, man, I'm just getting kind of sick of this. Well, there was a guy in the class there that I was friends with, he and his wife, Ryan, Ryan and Ann Raina, some of you old heads may remember them. He was in his doctoral program, great guy, great, great uh, lady. Um, and you know, he was, he and I were thinking about this. Well, it time, came time for him to have the floor for something. And he gets on there and he writes a website. And we all look at that. And one guy in the room said, if we go to that website, then we will probably have the FBI knocking on our door. And he said, you're right, you might. But this is a legitimate organization, or let me rephrase my, my words. It's a recognized organization, registered nonprofit in the United States. It's illegal to practice this, what this website espouses in this country, but it's not in other countries. And now he's got our attention. And it was, I won't tell you what it was, but it was a organization that celebrated and promoted pedophilia. Um, and so without getting too graphic into some of the things that were in that class, it was just, but when he said that, what do you think the reaction in the room was? Other than, how does this guy know about that website? You know, because that was mine. I'm like, you know, who are you and how do you know about this? Hopefully you've done research. But, because no one else knew. And what do you think the reaction to people in the room was to that, to him putting it there? They were shocked. What, what do you think some of the words were? Like, how can you... Why would you say that? They were appalled. They were like, really? That is disgusting. How can that even be here in America? There ought to be, there's laws against that. How can that even be a recognized organization? And he said, well, wait a minute. Are you binding your morals and your truth on them? Ooh. I was like, go, Ryan. You know? <laughs> and I thought, man, that's brilliant. Because he used their argument, of, oh, you can't bind your truth and your morals on people. And, but yet you are. Well, that's different. How? And so he made this point that there's got to be a standard of right and wrong and truth. And when we elevate ourselves to the level of being the determiner of what is right and wrong and truth, where do we end up? We're guiding ourselves 
Okay, we're guiding ourselves, and it starts here, and it digresses away. So what we're trying to lay a foundation of, that there is a foundation of truth, and that truth rests in God. He is the determiner of right and wrong and what is truth. And as Mike referred to last week, uh, a Rubel Shelley book, the ink is dry. The ink is dry on truth. Okay. Now, how we work things out in our life, things, you know, okay, yeah, it's sticky, but it comes back to a basis of truth. And part of that, understanding that, is understand that we're made in the image of God. That is set. All right, so with that foundation, now, that's a lot. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay. So when we realize we're made in the image of God, but we're not God, then we are, we're going to play this out here, how that leads us into truth with that. All right. We're going to hang out one, two verses today. We're going to read them, then we're going to kind of break them down a little bit. Genesis 1. What's happening in Genesis 1? Oh, man, creation. It's happening. I mean, it's bam, 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 bam. Or if you're an old earth, bam, bam, bam. If you're a young earth, bam, 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 you know. Whichever it is, God created it and said, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. <laughs> then you get down here to verse 26. And he says, then God said, let us make man or Adam is the original there, humankind, in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. What's next? Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them to be fruitful. If we get further, we will. But we're going to really want to hang out in these two verses for the next few minutes with that. Okay, several things we see. You know, one, first of all, before we get into that, determining what it means to be made of the image of God is a multifaceted thing. So you look at it this way, you look at it this way, you look at it a lot of different ways. Uh, to be such a vital part of the narrative in Genesis 1, there's not a much detail given as to what that means. But what we do know is that the Hebrew people that received this had a pretty good idea of what was going on. Uh, also, just a, a note of understanding, first, this whole thing is Hebrew poetry at some level. Now, I could, I could diagram a sentence a mile long when I was in, in, back in the day when you used to do that, but you get me understanding poetry and literature was not my thing. Uh, cliff notes were my friend. I think they have spark notes now, but cliff notes, I had my own library of, you know, for every book I ever read, I had a little black and yellow striped uh, summary of it, and uh, it helped. <laughs> um, but this is Hebrew poetry, and it's parallelism. And, and basically, parallelism is uh, when you say something, and then you say it again, maybe in a different way for emphasis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the idea is the emphasis of what is happening here. This is, this is a big thing, verse 27. And that's why uh, the, the writer did what he did. Well, the first thing he says is, uh, we are created. All right. Uh, it is a triune decision. You see that? Then God said, let us make man in our image. So this Father, Son, Holy Spirit, if you haven't, you don't know what that means, triune, uh, God, go back to the very beginning of this series online, you can see it, and where we discuss there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, or God the Word, before he became Son, he was probably Word. <coughs> um, it was their decision to place the image or likeness onto humanity. Uh, if... Uh, and if God's idea was to place his image on humanity, who is against the idea? The devil. Satan, the devil. He wants to, if he says, here we go, um, humanity is going to carry my image. Nothing else in all my creation is going to carry it, but humanity is. 
not even angels are going to be made in my image. Now, if you play that one out in what some thought is about where Satan came from, you know, there's a lot of jealousy stuff there. So we won't, that's another topic for another day. But, so he's going to oppose what God has made good, all right? Uh, he gave limited authority to rule. Look here, verse 26. And let them rule or have authority over what? Fish of the sea, what else? And the birds of the air over the livestock. Move on. Yeah, so, and you think about it, we have dominion. So what have human beings been able to train? Yeah, think about, is there an animal that they've not been able to at some level train and have dominion over? You think about, huh? A toddler. A toddler <laughs> is an animal all to itself. If you're in those days, you know it. If you're past those days, you, thank you, thank you Lord, we survived. Uh, I always say, though, if you're, if you're not in those days and you're going to be in those days, learn it at the toddler stage so that whenever they're teenagers, it's the same battle. You're already a step ahead. Uh, but um, get your bluff in early. Uh, it's the only parenting advice I have. Get your bluff in early. Um, <coughs> and then don't be, anyways, that's not, we're not in a parenting class. Uh, so you think about it. A dolphin, a very large mammal, can we, have they been trained? Yeah. Have killer whales been trained? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not all of them, but there are wild animals. I mean, you get old, what's his name? Who was it? Siegfried and Roy at the back in the day that stick a, his head into a lion's mouth? Dummy. But still, he didn't close his mouth on it because there was some training that was there. You go to the circus, they pop that whip, and those tigers are like, I don't like it, but I'm going to stand here anyway. I mean, come on, it can happen. The bears, everything. We've been able to do that. Uh, livestock, pretty easy to train livestock, isn't it? Just throw out some feed and they'll come to you. Uh, so we have dominion, but what is our dominion or authority? Uh, what don't we have authority over? While we have authority over the fish of the sea, we don't have authority over the sea. I mean, you think about it. Did y'all see the news? This uh, young lady solo trip around the world started in Spain, ended in Spain. Uh, first one, I think she's 28 years old or something like that. Uh, was on the news the other night. I rarely watch the news, and that's what I, I was like. That's a good story. Um, but man, there was this one video of her in her cabin where she felt something about to happen, and she braced, and it threw her up against the cabin, broke ribs. <laughs> Um, all this stuff, no control over the sea. What about the wind? No wind. Birds are there, but not the wind. Uh, we, we have over the livestock and even the plants that we can grow, but we can't do anything when the volcanoes erupt. We can't do anything when the earth shakes. Who's in charge of that? God is. And, say it again, says Jesus, because he said what? Be still. Oh, man, even the winds obey him, meaning that they don't obey us. Um, if you've ever been caught in something like that, you know it's not fun. So we have a limited dominion that we've been given by whom? By God. We, we did not uh, take it. It was given to us. And we share some things with other created things, though we're different. Uh, one, we're dependent. Nehemiah 9, 6 says, nothing exists outside of God. Acts 17, Paul making his case uh, to a pagan audience. We live, breathe, and have our being because of God. We're dependent upon God, one for our existence. We did not create ourselves. We just, there was no way to do that. Even procreation uh, is still as many babies that are had every year if you've ever been through the situation where you couldn't or had trouble, you realize what a miracle that really is and, and how God uh, is involved in so much of that. Sustenance. 
we don't make ourselves breathe, we don't make our hearts beat, we don't make our brains function. Now we can train those things and there's medical interventions, thank goodness for all that, but we don't sustain ourselves. Uh, on an everyday, less automatic level, uh, we can make great things happen. I mean, you think about uh, the buildings and you think about the creative things that happen. Um, have you been to the Bible Museum and watched the local artist and, and their creative stuff. Have you seen that? Uh, take some time and do that. We have, how many do we have? We got two, one, two, three. We have three uh, of, our, of our artists that have artwork. And what they did, uh, this is over at the Biedenhorn Bible Museum. So yeah, we have some like cool art stuff here in Monroe. <laughs> um, I didn't really know what I was looking at, but it's like, okay, that's really cool once you read the stuff and you see it. Uh, they gave they, they commissioned a whole bunch of artists, local artists, and uh, they have put uh, and gave them verses and said, paint this or use some type of medium of art, sculpture, different things, and uh, come up with, with a, a, a rendition or an image of this. And so uh, three, three of ours, I think, uh, Tony uh, Thomas, uh, was uh, was chosen, did a beautiful job. Uh, Lindy Loveland did <coughs> one, and hers was the baptism of Jesus. And then um, Christy, Christy Dunn. And you go through that, and you see all these different pieces. Like I said, I don't, I don't see what they see, so I can appreciate what they see when it comes to art stuff. But it was really cool. It was packed on that opening. Um, and then you come through and you're like, okay, man, this is really good. Now be careful. There is this one of this guy. And I get it. I get it. I mean, it was Adam and Eve. He was given the garden. And they don't have any clothes on, just like Adam and Eve. But you're like, okay, you're really trying to shock us here. And it was shocking. But uh, <laughs> anyways, I mean, but, you know, look. I mean, and seriously, and I, this is going to be funny. I think it will be. But the problem was, did y'all see it? Have y'all seen it? Okay. Uh, does anybody, see, you know what I'm talking about? The Adam and Eve one? I put them on the time that was in front of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's full frontal, and you're like, well, okay, I get it. But, and I didn't, I wasn't there long enough to see this, but someone told me. It was the tan lines. <laughs> okay, if Adam and Eve are running around naked in the garden, no shame. There are no tan lines. <laughs> and so I'm like, that was a whole shock effect. That was just a whole shock effect. And I was like, whoa, let's just keep rolling here on this one. So anyways, but, but my point being, creativity, and we'll get to that in a second. On a day-to-day -day basis, skyscrapers, we, you know, all these different things that we do and build and create. But you know what? The raw materials to do that and the inspiration didn't come from us. It came from God. So we're dependent on so many uh, things. All right, we've got to roll. Uh, we are created in God's image. So we're created, and we as humanity are created in God's image. This makes us distinct from the rest of creation. Nothing else carries the image. We do. This is where the rubber starts meeting the road here. We're created human beings with distinctions, male and female. God made this distinction and stamped his image on both. If you're a man, you carry the image of God. If you're a woman, you carry the image of God. Both glorify God and serve a purpose for glorification, though we may do it distinctly based on our maleness or our femaleness. We know that God reveals himself through creation. Uh, Romans 1 sees that. You know, it says that. You just can't go out there and see what you see and think, oh, this just happened. Uh, we carry uh, God's image. Therefore, we are the one that people look at and see Jesus, see God, see the Holy Spirit. And we're going to flesh that out. We're made male and female to reflect who God is. To that end, we have some of the same characteristics that God has in finite ways. For example, we've already talked about dominion. We rule. Okay? 
Now, there may be some things in this world that are prey and predators, but we rule our limited dominion. Uh, well, what else? What else characteristics of God? Let's just get feedback and bounce it around. What sort of characteristics do we carry as humanity that we share with God? Okay, so, and, and so I'm going to say that the Spirit, and, and I'm going to pause right there. All right, this is, again, discussion. See, there's a lot of foundational groundwork that we can't cover, but this is all online in our Renewing Your Mind series, if you want to go look at it, and we've talked about this, that we're body, soul, and spirit. Okay. Paul says that in 1 Thessalonians 5. We have a physical body. I have a body, you have a body. The heart pumps the same way. The lungs are, should work the same way. Now, we have this physical thing. We have a soul, and that makes us distinct. That's where our personality is, that are, is held. That's where our narrative, how you know, things that have, you know, we shape in our minds and how that guides us, emotions and thoughts and our wills, our decisions. And then we have this thing called our spirit. And that is that tricky one. Uh, some people would say the soul and the spirit are the same thing. Maybe. That's okay. But I'm going with body, soul, spirit, the, the, the triune, uh, the, the nature of a, hum, of a human being. Um, that, that spirit is that life force in us. And, and so this is, where, this is where Dave's opinion begins. So that and depending on where you go, Go to Circle K and 95 cents, get you a cup of coffee. Five dollars at Starbucks, get you a cup of coffee. That's all this opinion is going to get you, is that, you know, you got to add something to it. But Dave's opinion is, and it makes sense in my mind, is uh, that that is when God breathed life into us, our life spirit came in. That was, that was him stamping his image on us. Romans 8 says that the Holy Spirit, and this is, gets to what Susie said, testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. So there is a distinction. What that is and how you work the nuances of that out, I'm not real sure, but that's just kind of where I am. It makes sense in my mind. You know, I'm open to whatever discussion on that. Think about that. Study that out. I may be wrong and that's okay. But whatever it is, we carry the image of God. Whether that is our spirit and keep, gives us life or not, I don't know. Um, but we know that this Holy Spirit testifies to our human spirit, whatever that is. And so we share those characteristics of God. Animals do not. So did my puppy go to heaven? All puppies go to heaven. Go with that. <laughs> go with that. Make you feel good. <laughs> it's got all dogs go to heaven. Yeah. Walt Disney. Ugh. The... Uh, <laughs> So, sorry, but, you know, that's probably a bigger can of words than anything else we just opened, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, anyways, what else? What other characteristics do we share? We create. We create. Boy, like if I gave everybody a thing of Play-Doh in here, and I said, just create something. I mean... I don't know telling what I would create, but, you know, I would probably be snowmen because I can, I can do that, you know. Uh, but we could come up with 45 different things, you know. What else? Love. love. We have the capacity to love. Um, you know, I've been around with some snakes. There's no love. There's appreciation. I see a king snake. I don't kill it. I see a rat snake. I don't kill it unless I open up the drawer in my shop and see it sitting there, and it scares me. Then I kill it. But rattlesnake, gone. Copperhead, gone. But there's no love. It's not like they're coming up to me, snuggling up to me, you know. If they are, they're sizing you up to eat you. Uh, but uh, don't like that, Christy. You know. Well, good. I'll keep talking about it then. The <laughs> but... Um, what else? Love? What else? Free will. Free will. Boy, the, the, to make a decision to do something um, is, is what we took. And the, we have the biggest decision to accept or reject. 
Yeah. Compassion, to have compassion on somebody, to have empathy. Look, I'm a deer hunter. I've shot deer. The others ran off. Okay? A little while later, they come back and go back to eating. Do they have a little wonder what's going on? Yeah, but, you know, the hunger uh, overrode the, the compassion maybe that might have been there for some reason. Yeah, so we have that empathy. Now, so here's, here's a list of finite ways that we do this. Dominion, love, relationships, community. Now, there are animals that have some of this soulish type stuff, but it's not the image of God. Morality, we talked about that exclusively, extensively, rather. Creativity, we talked about that. Appreciation for beauty. I'm not sure, I'm not sure when the fish jumps out of the water and says, man, it's a great lake, look at that sunset. <laughs> I don't think they do that, but we can sit there and watch it till it's done, or the mosquitoes get us. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's we have this appreciation for beauty. Uh, we're builders, we're protective, we have religious capacity to sacrifice and worship. And as Chris said, the, 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 the will, free will to choose to that or not do that. Uh, we give life, huh? What about conscience? Our conscience, and that goes with our morality and our, our compassion and our ability to feel guilt and know when there has been a moral that's been violated and we're like, ooh. In fact, the Bible even talks about that if you if, if the further you get away from a God consciousness, our, our conscience can be seared like with a hot iron, and that's further down the road. And that goes to empathy that we can feel for people. Um, so a lot of things uh, that are there. All right, so this, where, this is where, oh, one thing I do want to say before I move on to this next thing. We've been given a distinct purpose as image bearers of God. Third commandment was do not make any graven images or engrave any images to represent me. Why? Huh? It becomes an idol. And why else? Where's the image of God already? On us. We become the image of God. We're the one that represent God. Can we make ourselves an idol? Oh, yes, we can. We sure can. And there, therein is, is, again, we're talking foundational things. Letting God be God and us be in his image and represent and glorify him. He put our image on us. So people that come in contact with us need to see who? Him. Sin buries the image of God. The goal of sin is to separate us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 bears this out. Sin wants us to make us think we can live independently from God. This goes against our nature because we were designed to be dependent on God and to reflect God. And, okay, now I'm going to do a lot of reading here because this is very, I don't want to missay anything. The image of God, while still in humanity, is buried in broken vessels of fallen flesh. It's still here. But because of the fallen nature, because of sin and the brokenness in our life, it gets buried down in there. And boy, we see this in ourselves, we see this in other people, and we're like, good night, is there anything redeemable in that person? Yes, it's just down deep. And sometimes it takes a little digging. Our image is distorted. God is in the business of reforming his image in us. He removes the sin that it destroyed. Okay, this is where I'm really reading. Redemption, the price paid for our release, brought justification, making things right with God, and sanctification to make things holy. And that happens only with, as Susie said, the Holy Spirit joining in with our same spirit, saying you are a son or daughter of God. That is who you are. You're made in my image. And as that is worked out and walked out, so does our walk change. When sin was cut away, Colossians 2, the image of God inside of us was unburdened 
and allowed to flourish, allowing our true identity to move towards holiness. It begins to refine and reshape us into the image he created us to be, his image. He uses the Holy Spirit. He uses his holy people in order to let that image of him be dominant in our life and less flesh in our life. That's Romans 8. Uh, salvation requires submission to the fact that we need God. Maturity can be described as the struggle between independence and dependence, and we're more dependent on him, therefore his image in us can be come out more. All right, so here it is. Here's the rubber meets the road. Okay, that's a lot. Implications of what the image of God is on us. The image of God is stamped into every human being. Therefore, certain characteristics of God will come out in their lives. Okay? An atheist who does not believe in God or a non-Christian who rejects Jesus uh, or a person who is just wrought into immorality that everything is out there can still have compassion for people and love their family and can still have do good humanitarian work. Why? Because of the image of God. Because if, if it wasn't something good in them, then a person who rejects God would be the worst person in the world. Not necessarily. They could be great people, just lost. And, but how, why are they able to do great things and do good things and love people? Because they have the image of God in them. Uh, a person who is struggles with sexual sins, whether it be immorality of a heterosexual nature or uh, immorality of a homosexual nature, um, can still have a capacity to love and be kind and be a good person just lost. Why? Because they bear the image of God but have been duped by the enemy into saying what is wrong is right and rejecting what is right. Does that make sense? A person who is in this cultural term, gender dysphoria, uh, and I say cultural term because I don't think it's a, made it to the clinical world yet. I don't know. Has it made it to the clinical world? It's made it to the clinical world. So there's a diagnosis, which means it's a disorder. So you know, <laughs> that's, that's not popular to say, I'm sure. But uh, so it's, you know, it's a clinical term now, their term, not mine, but whatever it is and says, I'm a man, but I'm transitioning to be a woman and whatever goes with that, can they still have a capacity to love and do good things? Yes. Why? Because of the image of God in them. They still bear the image of God. You can change all this right here and get help doing it, but the image of God is still buried deep in. The addict of whatever nature of addiction, whether it be the serial adulterer because of a sexual addiction, or a person with drugs, alcohol, life issues, codependency, whatever it is, who has burned bridges, comes in for the, put a number on it, 12th time, second time, 15th time, and says, I'm ready to change, this is it. Are they sincere? Probably. Yes, why? Because they've got an end of themselves and they saw the image of God. And they see the image of God people and that's what I want. Yes, they're sincere. They're ready to change. As a person who, as people, generally speaking, who deal with people in any of those issues, when, how can we have compassion on the person struggling with whatever we just said? It's because of the image of God. And I know, I know, I've not necessarily walked this out personally, but I've walked it out with several people. When you've been hurt, it's tough not to be cynical. When you've been for the 15th time, or whatever it is, it's tough not to be cynical. It's tough not to be forgiving. It's, it's, it's easy to be s skeptical. 
But the image of God says what? I'm going to forgive, and we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. We're not going to be ugly to you. And so, if sin in our world universally, in our lives individually, lies at the heart of every one of those problems, from sexual um, identity and, and issues that go with that, to addiction, to our own just maybe private sins that nobody else knows about, if we're dealing with all that, if that is the root of the problem, then what's the solution to the problem? Jesus. The gospel is. So what do you share with a person who is a man dressed like a woman? You share the gospel. You share Jesus. What do you do with the person that's struggling with homosexuality and same-sex attraction? You share Jesus. What do you do with the person that, that, that comes in and says, okay, this is my 15th time through rehab? You share Jesus. It's the gospel that addresses it. And we entrust that at the core of all that stuff that's going on in their life is just buried underneath there is the image of God and when we speak Jesus it speaks to that and we do that with compassion and love we don't have to accept or approve or what was the affirm but we can speak Jesus we affirm the gospel in a person's life and that's what creates change Logic does not, because obviously if I am taking the maleness of my biology and wanting to eradicate it and take on the femaleness that I was not created with, logic is not going to help me, because <laughs> that doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't make sense in a logical way, but in a convoluted, distorted logic, okay, I think I can get there. So what, what penetrates through all that? The gospel does. And that's how we share the gospel with other people. Why do we do that? Because of the image of God. Now, that probably didn't answer very many questions, but it gave a foundation of where we start, that we look at people, no matter who they are, as image bearers of God, and sin has buried that image. And what frees that? The gospel does. And that's why we stay gospel-centered with that. And that's what drives our truth with that. Okay? Now, if you have any questions, Mike will answer all of them next week because he'll be back. <laughs> all right. Again, we're trying to lay foundations that maybe we hadn't thought of because if you, don't, if you, if you come into the middle of a conversation, you're completely lost. Completely lost. So go back to the, to the beginning of here we are. This is where we start. Okay, that's a lot, and that's enough.